Hello and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Malika Hope, head of product for small business and self-employed individuals at Intuit. Intuit, as most people know, is the world's largest provider of accounting software. And Malika is here to talk to us specifically about how Intuit has managed to, through customer focus, continuously innovate upon its product. And with that, here's my interview with Malika. Hello, Malika. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for taking some of your quarantine time to, to speak with us today. Got nothing but time these days. Apparently. All my <laughs> all my uh, bookings that were waiting for a while to actually show up suddenly just decided to all book simultaneously. I wonder how that happened. Um, <laughs> so Malika Hope, head of product for Small Business and Self-Employed Group. Tell us about Intuit. Sure. So Intuit is made up of a number of different products that you guys are probably very familiar with. And so we produce TurboTax. Uh, that's a product we build in Canada and the United States. We have professional tax products. And uh, we also have uh, QuickBooks, which is our primary product that serves the small business sector, which is the area that I work on. And so QuickBooks has um, a number of different integrations and connections, leveraging a lot of different technologies to provide small business owners and self-employed with ways to power prosperity and um, achieve success in their financial lives and in their business lives. And so it covers a number of different components, automates complex tasks, um, allows people to work together, um, allows users to work anywhere and anytime from the cloud. So there's a lot of different components that at the end of the day are helping small business owners feel success when it comes to their businesses. Excellent. I mean, you guys also own a number of other products, uh, one of them being Mint, uh, which is probably the software I've probably been using the longest next to an operating system in <laughs> nice. Microsoft Office. Uh, yeah, I got, I mean, I think I was using that before you guys officially launched in Canada. You recently bought Credit Karma too. Um, yes. So, yep, uh, goodbye there. And I'm not sure what Profile is. We can talk, oh yeah, Profile is the actual like accounting tax software, right? Yeah, it's professional tax software. Um, and yeah. we also have ProTax, which is our online professional tax software that launched uh, somewhat recently in Canada. So many options. Good. Well, let's just say, put it this way. You guys are the 800-pound gorilla of bookkeeping and accounting in, in the world, <laughs> are you not? Was that a compliment? You're the big kids on the street, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so yes, it was it was a compliment, although to some people, it's just like, no, nah, company I got to take down. Uh <laughs> <laughs> the challengers. So anyway, so before we jump into uh, the feature sets and everything else, so tell us about the history of Intuit and how it developed from wherever it started to where it is today. Yeah, how it started is a bit of a folklore within uh, within Intuit, actually. So our founder, Scott Cook, he's still uh, very involved with the company. I've met him a couple of times. The way the story goes is he was sitting at his dinner table with his wife watching her balance her checkbook, and he thought there has to be a better way. And so that's <laughs> how, line. yeah, well, and that's how Quicken was developed, which was our first product. And that table is actually in the campus center on our campus in Mountain View in California. So you can sit at the legendary table and see so, where uh, into it was birthed. So, so your version of the HP shed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So that's how it started. And since then we've been innovating, you know, products to uh, enable people's financial lives in a number of different ways, whether it be through, you know, personal tax, business tax, uh, business accounting management, um, all sorts of things. So let's talk about your role in particular. So yeah. it's a long title and it's a vital area, specifically small business and self-employed individuals, which probably do not make up, no one individual makes up the massive amount of your user licenses, but I would think is probably a sizable chunk of the overall total business, is it not? Yeah, it is a sizable chunk of the business and it's been a big focus area for, for the business. So tell us about what it is you do in your day to day. Oh man, uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> complicated question. <laughs> I know I get asked that all the time. You know, product management is something that a lot of people don't totally like have a hard time wrapping their heads around. My mom asks me every weekend what it is again that you do all day. But <laughs> at the end of the day, um, my team's job is to understand our customers better than anyone else first and foremost. So understanding small business owners, uh, my team covers uh, within Canada, the QuickBooks online platform, uh, the mobile app, the payments platform, the QuickBooks online payroll product, and the self-employed product. So a lot of different components there. And so in a, several different customers, you know, we've got customers that are employers that need to pay employees. We have sole proprietors that have to do business on the go. 
we have customers that are sending invoices and wanting to get paid as quickly as they can. We, we serve accountants and bookkeepers that also serve those small business owners. And so once we understand our customers really well, then we can understand the problems that are keeping them back from being prosperous and building the most successful businesses possible and um, providing for their families. So we understand the customers, we understand the problems that are holding them back or ways that we can help. And then it's the product management team's job to translate that into a strategy by working with designers, developers to actually build it into a product that is what our users see. And so it's really, you know, translating those customer needs into actual viable products. So if I'm doing my job, I'm just helping my team uh, do that effectively. So at the end of the day, it's all about coming back to the client and understanding their needs in life and basically doing what you can to make it easy, essentially. Exactly. Good. So let's talk about the entire uh, most recent win. So let's give me some examples of, of actionable steps that were taken within the company and the product itself that you would say are some of the bigger ones you've done in the last several years that uh, would really kind of stand out. So, I mean, I could give you a really good, you know, contextual example, given what's happening uh, in our economic climate right now. Uh, mm -hmm. You might be aware of a little uh, issue called COVID-19 uh, that's happening, um, affecting all of us. No, no, I was on the beach <laughs> in uh, Jacksonville. I had no idea what you're talking about. Sorry. <laughs> Take that so shot. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, that's having um, an incredible impact on everyone. Um, and especially small business owners. And so you see what uh, the government is, is doing to help small business owners get through this. And that's something that we, you know, we just want to be there to help and support that in any way that we can. And so, for example, there's a 10% subsidy for payroll taxes that was announced. And so immediately our payroll team uh, built out the calculations to support all the complex rules that are uh, associated with that. And that's already been released live in market. And so that just takes, you know, a burden off the small business owner's life if they don't have to come up with those calculations on their own. And there's um, additional subsidies where we knew that we would we had the information within the QuickBook files to calculate if a user is actually eligible for those subsidies. And so now when a user logs in, we're able to run a quick scan of their books and determine if they actually are eligible for those specific subsidies, surface that information to them and direct them to the appropriate resources. And so those are just some examples of how we've been able to pivot really quickly and impact our customers with the most important issues that are affecting them right now. Um, I mean, yeah, no kidding. Talking about quickly, uh, you know, in those, <laughs> in those in those instances, we're not talking about six months development cycles. We're talking about literally you probably pump that out in a couple of days. And that is, I can't tell you how how grateful I mean, your clients must have been for some of that. Because I mean, these some of these programs are not they're nothing shy of complex to understand whether or not they qualify. It does involve going back and looking at their books and comparing, you know, different revenue periods against each other. Um, and and I think yeah, if you were able to push that out in an alert as to say, hey, based on these numbers, it looks like you should be doing X. That is, you know, it, that's, they're going to think that the, they're going to wonder if the AI is working already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, the genie, we're made yeah. really come together. Yeah. yeah. And and speaking of AI, I mean, that, that brings us to another big feature that we announced um, at our, our annual conference called QuickBooks Connect in November. And so if we have all this data from the small business owners, we understand how they've been doing business, you know, money that's coming in and out, what liabilities that they may potentially have. We've actually been able to um, develop a cash flow planner feature that mm -hmm. can take that historical information and actually start making projections of the future. And so it can give a customer you know, an idea of whether or not they might be late for payroll and whether or not if they delay an expense by a couple of days, that could make an impact. We've seen that over half of the small business owners we talk to have had to pay themselves late so they could pay their employees on time in certain instances. So cash flow management is such a critical area that small businesses are affected by. And, you know, we're especially finding that brought to light given what's going on in the economy right now. And so mm -hmm. it's just spurred us on even more to continue to go deep on cash flow management and that cash flow planner we should be bringing to market soon, along with a number of other different features that will help users uh, make responsible decisions with their cash flow that they might not have been able to do otherwise. Yeah. And I honestly, I think it can't be understated how vitally important that is because I mean, I've, I've talked to, I specifically deal with primarily business owners in my practice and I've had that conversation and, you know, someone just get into certain habits, like, you know, they pay a certain bill right when it arrives or they pay bills mm -hmm. on a certain day of the week. And, you know, they're not necessarily even taking advantage of the credit terms that are offered to them, right? If they have net 60, net 30, whatever it is, they find themselves just, their habit is driving their inability to pay themselves on occasion or their infrequency of paying themselves. 
And there's a better way. And it's interesting because, I mean, you start thinking about the ability of that AI to, you know, if it does, if you do input the credit terms in there, to juggle all that for someone and say, this is the payment pattern that maximizes your total, your total cash. And therefore, hey, you only really need X amount of working capital in the business. You could technically take more. There's a feature that will definitely pay for, pay for the, the uh, user license <laughs> in the eyes of most truck <laughs> entrepreneurs. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the hope. And I, it, we're fortunate that we have all these different types of information. So we have the core accounting platform, but then if we're also, if they're using our payments platform, or, you know, we're seeing, we're helping them move money in and get paid faster. If they're also using our pay, payroll platform, we know when they have to set that cash aside to make payroll on time. And so we are able to take all those inputs and really create um, a complete story that they might not be able to find elsewhere. I find you, I feel like you guys serendipitously found yourselves in the middle of AI simply because you were a big data company before that that term existed when it came down to it, right? I yeah. mean, yeah, I mean, if you have you have every transaction that a employer or any kind of business needs, that's a huge data set to work with. And when you started, you know, I guess when that moved to the cloud and you were able to potentially test across that all anonymized, the opportunity set that opened up for you guys was enormous. Yeah, and it's just more opportunities to help our customers um, make better decisions and that and that's what we use it for. And it's really exciting for us that we are able to consistently innovate on making better decisions and helping customers make better decisions. I think as we look ahead uh, to future years of what we're going to be able to do with new technologies, with machine learning and what have you, uh, it's a really exciting time, exciting time to be in accounting software. <laughs> Most <laughs> yes, people would never think. Every business will be cash flow optimized uh, by robots. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So tell me about the, you know, in terms of what it is you do, a big component of this is simply gathering information from the end user. So what are your mechanisms for how you gather that information in order to then take that information and make it actionable? Yeah. So one of the most popular terms you'll see across into it, um, it's called a follow me home. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that our founder, Scott Cook, um, heavily evangelizes. And so you might think you know what a user is doing or what a customer is doing based on what you're seeing in their file, what they tell you through conversations. But a lot of the time that doesn't really give you the full picture of how their day goes, what actions they're taking, you know, what what painful processes that they might just have gotten used to doing and that are things that you could save them time with or, or solve pain for that they don't think to ask for. And so what we do with the follow me home is we'll visit a customer in their workspace and simply observe how their day goes, like what procedures that they take. And so we might ask someone, hey, can we come visit your office on the day that you pay your bills? and just see what process that you follow there or the day that you file your taxes and watch what they do. And it's through actually being able to view um, and understand the workflows that people are taking, we're able to take those back to the office, you know, kind of analyze them and, and identify patterns that we're seeing or, or common traits that we're seeing or common pain that we're seeing across the board. And that helps spur the innovation uh, that we try to drive with our product team. So the follow me home is a huge component. And then we do a, a number of other things. We do tons of user sessions and remote sessions. We do a lot of rapid prototyping where, you know, if we have an idea for a new concept, we'll quickly write it down on paper. Like everyone in our product triad, um, which is design, product management and development should be able to make a scrappy prototype with a piece of paper. We immediately show it to a customer and walk them through a specific process. We like hear the feedback that they give us in the moment. And then we make a new piece of paper and bring another customer in. And we can see tens of customers going through that process in one day or even a couple of hours. And then you've gotten so much feedback and you're able to take that prototype and maybe take it to the next step of design. And so all of our innovation and development is always rooted in the customer. Uh, we like to call ourselves customer obsessed. And that term didn't really hit home to me until I started working with Intuit. I mean, yeah, it's a big term thrown around a lot as customer centric. It seems to be the buzzword that's replaced synergy in this <laughs> industry. But in general, yeah, no, it's it's if it, there are definitely some cultures that have, have been that way for long before that term existed. Interesting. So you're talking about so you talked about prototyping or or, or looking at features on a, on, a, on a sheet of paper. So what's the process for? Hey, I've got a great idea on how this could improve the client experience. How does that go from ideation to actual implementation? Yeah, that's a great question. So the rapid prototyping we generally do to verify a concept, because of course, we're, we're not all designers. If we're just making a scrappy prototype on a piece of paper, um, we're not necessarily going to get feedback on, you know, does this workflow work for you? But it, does the yeah. idea of something like this make sense or sound compelling to you? And once we kind of validate it that yes, 
you know, this does sound interesting to us, then we might take it to um, a very like scrappy design. So the designer would start making wireframes of here's what this could look like. And then again, we'll talk to customers and have them maybe go through that flow or we'll observe them similar to a follow me home. We'll just observe them trying to get through that more high fidelity prototype um, try to get through those wireframes and see if the workflow makes sense and we'll take feedback from them. And then we might build, a, you know, an actual working prototype, go through a similar process. And then, you know, once we've built that out, we've decided based on all the customer feedback we've gotten and all the insights we have, this is a viable feature that we want to bring to market. Then we might start a beta program, take a bunch of customers through it, continue to grab feedback, continue to make changes and iterate until we really think we've nailed it. And then we'll release it widely. And even when we release a feature live in product, we're still constantly going back, tweaking it, you know, adding improvements. Even with all of that customer work, it's it's hard to nail a feature the first time it goes to market. We try to do that as best as we can. Any great tech organization, you're not scared to go back and reevaluate and readjust features until we know that we're giving the user the best experience possible. So what kind of timeline are we looking at from getting to, from the concept of ideation to implementation, assuming it's something that the company says, yeah, you know what, this is a great feature. We need to get this into the into people's hands as fast as possible. You know, how long is that? I mean, I, it's hard to say because, I mean, a project can be very small or very large, but yeah. on average, what would you say reasonable size tweak would look like? I mean, yeah, it really depends on the feature. It could be weeks. It could be months. I mean, with the features I described to you earlier um, to help with COVID, that was days. Yeah. So it depends on the fidelity of the feature and the, the complexity of it, but we try to build with speed as a habit and move as quickly mm. as possible. And so the idea is we'd rather get something to market quickly, get that feedback and be able to make it better than continue to, to build on it, not let any you know customers see it and then release it and have it not be as effective. It's better to you know keep iterating on live product. Well, I mean, that's one of the large differences between moving, having gone from the... Uh, normal release cycle of, of published software to the cloud, right? Is that before you had to, you know, spend months testing, 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 make sure that it was as perfect as possible because you couldn't triage it once it was out in the wild, right? And it's before the yeah. internet that was. And now it's now it's a completely different world. It's like, get it out there. Does it work? No, fix it. Okay, does that work? No, fix it. It's just over yeah. and over again. So yeah, it's slightly buggier, but much better world because of it, because everything gets done in much faster release cycles. Yeah, I think people appreciate it. And and we, we work so closely with our customers and we're known for that. And I, I think a lot of them get really excited about the opportunity to give us feedback and to have, you know, their feedback really driving the decisions that we're making and, and improving the product. Yeah, as someone who probably signs up for every beta test known to man, um, <laughs> I, I totally understand that. I would rather play with the new features first mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to wait to know that they're 100% perfect. But that's yeah. just... Yeah, good, good. So uh, tell me about the types of businesses that you typically go out to for this. Is it, I'm guessing it's a large cross section. Is there a certain size you're targeting, a certain level of tech proficiency? What makes the ideal candidate for you to to provide feedback and help guide the process? I mean, ideally we're, we're looking at as diverse a range as possible. Yeah, like a te tech proficiency, I would say definitely not. If you're a good product manager, you're bringing the perspective of the customer and that customer could be someone that has zero tech experience or has been- Oh, that's you know, gotta be fun. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy, but it no. can be fun. But it's, you know, how do you take someone that either has worked on a, in the, on a desktop their whole life and has never been in the cloud? Or how do you take someone that's been using pen and, we have customers that use pen and paper to do their accounting still, that we've met with and try to understand their procedures and then get them on product that's based in the internet. If you can come up with a way to take the workflows from the pen and paper and make them work effectively online where, where that user can understand it and start thriving quickly, then we know we've done our job. And so we have to, while it's important to segment users to really understand who you're driving value to, it's really important to be able to build new features and new products in ways that it's not just, you know, one specific type of person that can use it. We want to be able to appeal to um, a number of different users and a number of different use cases and still provide that value. Fair enough. I mean, it's uh, diverse sets to get you the best results, although someone has never been in the cloud. I, 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 let's just say that I wouldn't want to be assigned to the technophobe <laughs> of the market. No, no, no. This is how your mouse works. <laughs> <laughs> 
well, not quite that technophobe, but I don't know. I don't mind. I mean, I I wasn't a particularly techie person um, growing up. I'm not your typical tech. I wasn't, you know, playing around with uh, DOS or any any of that stuff when I was younger. So I, I like to think I do bring the perspective of someone that isn't super deep in the technicals. And if I can still understand it and figure it out really quickly, then, um, you know, that gives me confidence that some of our users can as well. So how much of this development happens from, let's just say, top down versus bottom up? It sounds like we've been talking about a lot of bottom up driven innovation. Where does the people at the top, where do they get involved in product design as to say, we're going to push down this agenda from on high? Like, where does, where does that happen? I mean, we do get a top level strategy. Um, there's definitely a strategy that we get from as high up as the CEO. And then, you know, I work for the Canadian organization. So the Canadian leadership team, we present a strategy for Canada as well. But I think a, an effective product team is is really empowered to work within that strategy. And so if we identify, you know, here are some major focus areas for the Canadian business, for example, we empower the team to then say, go talk to customers and and look at, you know, internal data, business data, and let's come up with a way to satisfy those customers and the business in the most effective way possible. I think if the team is constantly just being given, you know, a very firm directive and not having that room to innovate and that room to identify new problems and kind of own their own roadmap and own their own destiny, that's really like curbing a lot of the innovation that you're going to see. And so I guess... No, the short answer would be while we're given strategic direction, certainly from above, uh, the innovations that we come up with, I'd say, are, are very much grown on the ground. Now, in fairness, QuickBooks was largely a little bit later to the cloud game than some of the other of the other providers. Now, good news about that is you don't have to be the first one to figure it out. Secondly, is you build a better technology. So there's a bunch of advantages to that. Plus, you had a huge install base to start with. So I'm curious, how much of the uh, of QuickBooks is still legacy desktop versus cloud? What's the cloud adoption rate look like versus uh, traditional lines of business? I mean, I don't know if I can get into the specifics of numbers there, but we, we certainly still have a healthy customer base using our desktop product. We still develop on our desktop products um, and they're, they're incredible products. So a lot of them have, you know, 20 plus years of development behind sure. them and we know they provide a lot of value. And I think the strategy that we've taken with the online products, you know, isn't to just take the desktop products and bring them online. That mm-hmm. would be a That's bit a short-sighted, yeah. yeah, as far as what we're able to deliver. But it's it's that fine balance of what are the components that we nail on the desktop that we know are really key to succeeding in the small business space or whichever space uh, that we're talking about uh, for the example. And then also identifying, you know, with all these new technologies that we have and everything that the cloud can drive, how can we take the goodness that we've given on the desktop and create new workflows and new efficiencies and even more innovative ways to work? And so we really, um, we still look at the desktop product. We still talk to desktop customers and try to understand um, what value they get from the desktop product. Um, And so it's always a balancing act on what's the best way to provide new innovation for a company like Intuit that is balancing desktop and cloud at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, right? Because uh, I've spoken to many many companies who are desktop softwares and migrate to the cloud. And as much as you guys would like to focus probably on one platform as it can be, you have, you have legacy business and that business is probably very sizable. And, you know, I'm sure if it was down to 1%, you'd probably be like, can we just buy you an internet connection per month? <laughs> like, you know, it'd be cheaper to do that than to basically nurture the um, nurture the, the the desktop version. So yeah, so I mean, this is this is compelling compelling conversation altogether because it's, we don't often get to look behind the curtain at someone in your role who basically has to go through this cycle of constant iterance. Where do you feel the challenges are in that position altogether? I mean, it's is it just that there's so many resources? There's only so many resources and so many ideas. You got to fight for your ideas, or is it just that sometimes there's a real disconnect between what thinks what you guys think needs to happen and the customers? Like, where is it that this job is not easy? I'd say definitely the hardest part for me right now is um, deciding where to focus with the resources that we're given. And, you know, we have we have a, a strong team or several strong teams um, that I work with in Canada. And it's, you know, we talk to so many customers all the time. And as I described, we're talking to a really diverse range of customers. That brings up a lot of different problems that we want to solve and a lot of different pain that we want to eliminate. And it's really being able to say, we're not going to be able to focus on certain things or we have have to decide that these one, two, three things are the most important to focus on. Mm. And then to be able to 
keep to that with conviction, I think is the hard part. Like we get thrown a curveball a couple of months into a certain strategy. Do we pivot on that strategy or do we keep going with the priorities that we've already declared? And as I'm sure you can imagine, when you're managing a team, you want to keep them focused on on consistent Absolutely. priorities. You don't want to disrupt. But at the same time, we always want to be solving the biggest customer problems that we can. And so and I want to help everyone and anyone yeah. that I talk to that gives me feedback. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, why haven't we done that yet? Or I'd love to solve that problem. So for me, it's it's kind of shielding the team and helping everyone stay focused when even I, I want to just focus on 10 things at once. Yeah. And uh, I'm notorious for saying things like, well, that shouldn't be too big a lift. And I just look at the developers <laughs> list like, I, I, I know, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I'm curious, how do you how do you help sort through that? Do you have some sort of like ranking mechanism or is it an open conversation about impact? Is it is it based on what's going to drive the bottom line bigger? Like what goes into that? What variables go into making the decision and what's more important than something else? Yeah, there's a lot of different things that will go in. Um, like first we start with, you know, the customer problems, but then even within then, yeah, we obviously have to think of what's the business impact going to be of this? How many customers are we going to reach with this? There's a number of different components that go in there. How confident are we that we can execute on it? What resources are required to build it? How long will it take to build? Is this something that, you know, is within our area of expertise as Intuit or as QuickBooks to do? Or is it something that we think we can create a durable advantage in doing uh, for our customers? So all of those different conversations happen. And then, yeah, there's a number of different ways we can maybe quantify some of those ideas or create formulas to prioritize. There's a ton of different inputs that go in. And I mean, I hope we get it right most of the time, but I mean, there's obviously arguments that can be made to prioritize things differently. And, and that's one of the you know hardest parts of product management in general, I think. It's not specific to Intuit. So I don't often speak to people in your specific position, and it's really nice to see and, and talk to someone who focuses just on nothing but constant improvement. You're like, you know, you're telling to be changed to Kaizen master or something like that. <laughs> so before we wrap up, there's three questions I ask everybody. Yeah, I just make you think blue sky once. First one is, if you had one wish for something you could change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Uh, I think, ooh, well, for the company and the industry and as a whole, those are very different things. All right, give me more. Yeah, you don't get to wish for more wishes, but I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you two. <laughs> for within the company, it would be, I guess, unlimited resources to solve all the different problems that I described before. And so, <laughs> you know, to developer be able to... hours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And maybe so. some people that can effectively work 24 hours a day. Like, no, but yeah, I would love to solve, I'd always love to solve more problems. So that would be really exciting. And otherwise, I think it would be, um, as far as the industry as a whole, it would be to get people excited about accounting and financial management. And I know that sounds uh, silly just to think of, you know, off the top of your head, but I'm a CA. I have a background in accounting and I get really excited about working with numbers and I just see how effective it can be for a business owner to, you know, take ownership of their finances and their budgeting and have a really solid understanding of how their decisions impact them financially. And I wish more people had that excitement about get, gaining that understanding and seeing what they can do with it. Uh, and I think I think we do a good job of bridging that gap, but I wish that there, we could help even more people uh, find the freedom that comes with uh, financial security and financial decision-making. As a financial planner, I fully understand where that geek, uh, gene comes from. So <laughs> I, I, share, I share it. So excellent. Second question is, in your experience, I guess, with the company, what's been the biggest challenge you've faced thus far and how did you guys overcome it? Oh, just overall challenge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the question is, you know, what's been the biggest challenge in the company to where it is today? But I can't give you full credit for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm modifying it a little bit. To me, a big, I mean, I could repeat the same thing that I described earlier, which is picking what we work on, which frankly, I think is the biggest challenge. Um, mm -hmm. I think a big challenge for us right now is, and we kind of touched on this before, is that delicate balance of desktop and online and um, how to manage both products and both customer bases at the same time and how to decide what decisions to make because we're, we're talking it to two different very different customer groups that have very similar problems and so marrying those two worlds and developing solutions uh, to meet the needs of both I'd say uh, can be challenging at times. Yeah I mean it kind of reminds me of the um, Steve Jobs book about how he talked about it his role being one of a curator essentially because <laughs> there's and you know especially in very innovative bright populated companies, it's it's really, there's no limit to the good ideas. The question is, which ones do you focus on? How do you affect that? 
nurture those and don't let them get, don't let the squirrels chase you, uh, your attention away from something else. Yeah. And how do you justify that those are the best decisions? Um, I think that's a key component as you move yep. a bit up the ladder. It's not just making the decision, but proving why it's the right decision that gets hard. No doubt. So last question for you is what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and it gets you up every morning to keep fighting the good fight? Ah, that's easy. It's my customers. They excite me all the time. And the, the best part about working for Intuit and, and being in such a culture where we're so heavily encouraged to engage with customers all the time is we never have a shortage of motivation. Like I talk to at least a couple of customers every day and it just makes you want to do better. It makes you, I talked earlier about how I want to give more people that type of financial freedom, like that is motivating. And so every day you can think of, you're not just thinking of a list of numbers or, you know, a list of customers' names. You're thinking of the specific customer, the gym owner, or like the honeybee manufacturer or whatever it is that you talked to last week and you understood their story and how they're supporting their family and how they got their start and why they're passionate about what they do. It's amazing working with small business owners. It's such an exciting part of our economy. And I would challenge anyone to work with small business owners all the time and not feel motivated to make their lives better. Yeah, I, I know it's funny because I, I do deal with a ton of small business owners in my business. I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's uniquely inspiring. You see these people coming from all kinds of backgrounds, achieving great things, struggling, dealing with curveballs like what we're going on through right now and just persevering. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lesson in, in motivation for anyone who ever gets involved in those worlds. Yeah. Yep. So, Lika, thank you so much for this. This has been fantastic. I'm sure everyone will find this look behind the curtain of what it is to innovate on a product uh, very, very interesting, especially given a product as well-established and in a company well-known as yours. And again, I thank you for your time. Thanks so much. It was great to be here. So I hope you enjoyed that interview with Malika Hope. That was a rare conversation with someone whose job is to do nothing but work on making their product better. And I hope you enjoyed that. So as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, I'm Jason Pereira, and this has been Fintech Impact. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.